There's still in the last session, technically, kind of bring it over on page 25, we're going to point B, the enemy's use of the principle of economy of force. We're going to look at the enemy's use of the economy of, or principle of economy of force in individual combat. The enemy usually applies the principle of economy of force against individuals by using tried and true methods that have worked before. If it's worked for him before, believe me, he'll use it again. He'll keep using the same thing until it doesn't work. Okay? Now, the more you have given in before, the easier it is for you to give in again. And the easier it is for you to give in, the less energy, time, resources, and etc. that the enemy has to use this time. So, of course, see, now, we're talking about sin, sickness, all these things. We're talking about uh, complacency, you know, knowing you should pray but not praying. And you think, well, I ought to go pray, but then you give in to not praying, then next time it's easier to give in to not praying, right? So this applies to everything. Now, and you even see some, I guess you would say, principles of psychology here because the enemy finds out what works against you and uses that, and it gets easier. And the more you do something, the easier it gets to do it next time. So he's not stupid. He's going to go with what works, right? Why should he try something new that you might recognize as an attack when he can use what's worked in the past, and it now your area of defense is weaker in that area, so it just makes it easier that he, he doesn't have to apply near the force or anything for it. So that's why you have to build up a strong defense against sin, sickness, any... Basically, I, I just like to tie it all up and say against all the works of the devil. You have to learn to hate them. You say, but I, you know, I mean, I don't practice sin, but I can't say I hate it, all right? Then you must develop a hatred, all right? And it, which is easy to do once you see that sin is bondage and that sin will lead into sickness and disease and all these other things. So, now, <clears throat> if you build up a good resistance to the enemy's tactics, for example, sin, he will have to resort to different tactics, and therefore he will have to work harder to get to you he will leave a hard target for a soft target. If you become a hardened target, in other words, if you start to resist him on a regular basis and it makes it harder for him to get to you, eventually he will leave you and go find somebody else that's an easier target. See, that's, you know what that's called? The principle of economy of force. That's what he's doing. Okay? He will not use, if he realizes that he is wasting too much time and energy trying to get you to do something, he understands the principle of economy of force too. And he won't allocate more resources than he can afford to lose. So, notice, if the enemy can get you to believe a non-biblical doctrine, he can set you on a path of deception. If he can get you to only hear the word and not do it, he can walk away and leave you to deceive yourself. So what is being a hearer, not a doer? See, it's amazing. Let me read the rest of it because I have it in here. Who would be a hearer and not a doer? No one would call themselves a Christian and do this on purpose. Nobody's going to say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Uh, yeah, I'm a hearer, not a doer. And if you ask somebody, are you a, do a Christian? Are you a doer of the Word of God? Yes, I'm a doer of the Word of God. Okay, then what are you doing? Well, and they try to tell you, and you realize that they're really not being a doer. Well, I go to church every Sunday. Well, what do you do at church? Well, we hear the Word of God. Well, so you're a hearer, not a doer. No, I'm doing because I'm going to church to hear. No, going to church to hear doesn't make you a doer. It makes you a hearer. It's when you leave church, if you go do it, then you become a doer. Nobody wants to say they're a hearer, not a doer. But since the Bible says that there are people that do this, there must be people out there that are hearers and not doers. Right? So we have to make sure, we have to analyze ourselves, examine ourselves. The Bible says to examine yourselves, make sure whether you be in the faith or not. So we have to analyze ourselves and make sure that we are hearers and doers and not just hearers. Right? <clears throat> now, you must define the deception or you may already be in it. So the enemy, let's look at the enemy's use in corporate warfare on the principle of economy of force. In the use of the principle of economy of force against a body of Christians, the enemy will try to conserve energy by getting the Christians to attack one another. If he can get you fight amongst yourselves, he doesn't have to put a whole lot of energy toward it. He can get you started and walk off and you'll finish it. 
That way he is conserving energy by using the Christian's energy. <clears throat> if he can have certain unbiblical doctrines accepted by the church, and I'm talking about, a, you know, say a particular church, then he is building a weakness into them so that he does not have to work as hard to cause an internal problem. He is setting up a weakness built into it because of wrong doctrine. At a desired time, he can pull the switch on his preset time bomb and be assured of its effectiveness. He is building a flaw into the system. If he can get a group to believe a wrong doctrine from the beginning, then that weakness is built in. And at any time, if that church or that group starts to become too strong, then he can kick that part out and the whole thing will fall. So we have to make sure that what we're believing is accurate, not accurate traditionally, meaning that we fit in with everybody, but accurate biblically, meaning that what we say we can prove by clear scripture and not by some contrived, you know, well, spiritually what this means and putting a spiritual implication on everything. If it's in the Bible, it's already spiritualized. Okay? That if it's in the Bible, it's already spiritual. You don't have to go deeper spiritual. You know, I've heard people do entire series of teachings on the, uh, <clears throat> what, the uh, how do they call it? Uh, the, what is it? I can't remember now. That, the Scarlet Thread. That's it. Out of Rahab's window. It's amazing. They do a whole series and can go through the whole thing and teach for months on this thread and how that thread runs through the whole Bible. I'm like, Rahab's thread doesn't run through the Bible. It ran out her window. <laughs> right? It was a physical piece of cloth. Okay? Next, <clears throat> the Christian's use of the principle of force, of the economy of force. <clears throat> in individual combat, the Christian's use of this principle is to use it in conjunction with the principle of mass. So you use the principle of economy of force to build your mass together so that you can attack at one place. So you have to learn to conserve energy. And, you know, it's kind of like as you get older, you learn that conserving energy is important. Isn't that right? <laughs> and, you, you, you know, I realized one day, it's like, I, I remember telling somebody, I said, you know what, I finally, I know it's time to lose weight. Because anything less than a quarter isn't worth bending over and picking up. You know, so it's time, you know, when I got to that point, I realized it. So, but it was called conserving energy, right? So, <laughs> you know, if a dollar bill gets blown away and it's six foot away and you're like, no, you ain't going to chase it, you know, then you know it's time to build up energy, right? So, now, the Christian should direct all necessary resources to get himself into fighting shape. That includes fasting, prayer, confession, witnessing, role training, everything. Once you have achieved a level of combat fitness, you begin to use the principle of economy of force to maintain the level with less energy expenditure. See, it takes more energy to get there. And once you get there, it takes less energy to maintain. Isn't that right? It's always easier to keep the weight off than it is to lose it. Right? If you lose it, it's easier to keep it off than it is to get it back and lose it and get it back. And, right? So it's easier... What I'm saying here is that it's easier to get into fighting shape, do what you're supposed to do, begin doing the disciplines to being a warrior, which is why I taught you that first. See, I keep emphasizing that. <clears throat> I have to emphasize it, okay? <clears throat> so, you know, every... Because what I'm teaching here is basically it would be classified as officer training. Okay? Now, there is not an officer in the military that has not been through basic. You go through basic to be a soldier before you learn to be an officer. You have to go through the discipline of basic before you go into the classes that deal with generalship, right? So it was just right that I do it the way I did it last time, right? So now, see, now you can go back and dig that stuff out and study that because now you know you really need it, okay? As opposed to just letting it sit there on your shelf. So, but once you get to fitness level, then you can maintain it with less energy expenditure where you used to have to yell to be effective when you were praying, now you can simply speak, but you have the same force behind it. So, now let's look at corporate warfare. Corporate warfare is the area where most Christians are already using economy of force, just not in a good way. Okay? They're, they're conserving their energy by not participating. Right? So that's not a good way. That's not the kind of economy of force we're talking about. Now, most Christians do not attend prayer meetings. They do not join in outreach. They are unwisely conserving their forces. 
These are the areas in which they should bring all they have to bear upon the situations at hand. See, the <clears throat> we look at outreaches and prayer meetings as extras, you know, for the really spiritual people. And we look at church as the essential or the main thing during the, during the week. The outreaches are the main thing. The prayer meetings, the, the church services, those are getting you ready for the outreaches. And if you're always in the church services and not going to the outreaches, then you're not even in the game. Right? The game is out there. This is the pep rally. This is the training before the game. But the, the game is out there. That's where you've got to go and you've got to show up to fight. And yet most people say, well, <clears throat> I'm not going to go to prayer meeting. You know, that's, that's okay. I'm just going to stay home tonight because, you know, it'll be all right if I miss prayer meeting. Or I'm not going to go at outreach. You know, come on, I go to church twice a week already. Well, guess what? Outreach isn't church. Right? Outreach is where the church exercises. Church is where the church, you know, the church service is where the church learns. But outreach is where it puts into action what it learns. If you're in here, you're a hearer. You're not a hearer while you're here. Right? And you're not a doer while you're here. You're a hearer while you're here. Let me get it right there. <clears throat> you're not a doer until you do it out there. So you hear here and you do there. So, unless you're there, you're not doing. You're just a hearer. Next. <clears throat> most Christian or many Christian groups are learning the value of putting the right people in the right position when they do they usually achieve economy of force the right people in the right position can do a job they're good at and one for which they are passionate and they can do it easier and with less effort than someone trying to fill a role or position for which they are neither qualified nor passionate put a passionate person in that area if you can that's what I said earlier. If you're going to have a prayer meeting and it's going to be praying over a certain situation, find the person that that situation really bugs them and let them lead the prayer meeting on that topic because they, they will become the lead horse. They will set the pace and everybody else will keep up with them. But if you have a person who is not passionate about it, first off, <clears throat> honestly, that's usually the reason you don't have many people show up at prayer meeting because the person who's not passionate about it is leading it. And when that happens, it dies. Because people go out there, and you have some people that are passionate, and they're trying to follow a person who isn't, and they know they really can't let go because they'll surpass that person, and they'll draw attention to themselves, and then it, they'll think it won't be good. So you have to find people that are passionate, put them in leadership, let them lead, and if you think, well, they'll all run off and leave us. Well, if that's the case, then let them, but at least they'll set a good pace. So, <clears throat> now... The following force multipliers can work together to synergistically cause a greater result. Now, these are force multipliers. In other words, <clears throat> this is what causes exponential growth and power and a synergistic approach when you can apply these things. So if you have superior knowledge in a certain area, then that's a force multiplier. Whatever level you're operating at, if you gain information in that area, it, it, it will exponentially increase the amount of force you can put in that area. Greater skill. Now, a lot of these things may be different people have them. And if you get the different people together, then each one of these will come into play and the sum total of the, of the group will be greater than the total of each person. And so you should look for people with these things. Superior knowledge, greater skill, optimism. <clears throat> that's a good, believe me, that's a good skill. Confidence, we call that faith. High morale, creativity and innovation. The ability to focus and concentrate on key targets and objectives. People that have strategic alliances with other people, with other groups. <clears throat> it's always good to have people like that. <clears throat> you have people that may be in a prayer meeting that have real close ties with other prayer meetings. And you will start to see how the fire can travel from one group to the other even though the only contact is a person. And there's a, there's a connection between the two. <clears throat> Next, excellent relationships with key people and organizations. Excellent communications among all people involved. Superior leadership at all levels. These are all force multipliers. Now, look at that one real quick, though. Excellent relationships with key people and organizations. It's good to have... Let's say you have a person that is... Uh, 
I don't know, a business person or something, and they're always down at City Hall, and they're always at the city council meetings. You know, they have to be there, or they're there, or they're interested in governmental things or whatever. Man, get them to the prayer meeting, even if they're not that in, much into prayer. Get them at the prayer meeting. And while you're there, ask them some questions. What, what's going on at city council? What happened? What are they looking at? What are they looking at this? And then pray with that. See, you will have insight into areas that you wouldn't have. Otherwise, you're just playing, praying some blanket statement. Lord, bless our government. And Lord, bless them and give them wisdom and guidance. Whenever you can get specific things to hit and target in that prayer meeting. Doesn't mean you're going to say the same thing every week. Next week, it might be something else. You, they may come in and say, you know, they're trying to you know, put an abortion clinic in next door here. Well, really, who's trying to do it? Well, they're trying to get it passed by the city council. They can do it. You, you might not know that because they don't advertise that stuff. But if this person's there and they hear about it, bam, you can hit it while it's still in the planning stages and kill it before it's ever born. You know? Hey, they like abortion. We can abort. <laughs> right? Hey. <clears throat> it's a spiritual thing anyway. So, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> All right. Number eight, the principle of maneuver. Let's look at the definition. The definition of the principle of maneuver is this. Place the enemy in a position of disadvantage through the flexible application of combat power. Okay, now this is pretty simple. One does, this is what George Patton said, one does not plan and then try to make circumstances fit those plans. One tries to make plans that fit the circumstances. I think the difference between success and failure in high command depends upon the ability or lack of it to do just that. In other words, if you're going to go in and start something, you don't go in with a preconceived idea of how it should look. You have to go in, <clears throat> for example, if I was going to go into a small country town, I'm not going to start plan. I'm not going to go there and sit down and, and plan some stained window cathedral. Right? Because most of the people, that would set them off. A lot of them wouldn't even come to it because it's too, you know, for a small country town, it's too fancy, too uh, uptown, so to speak. You know, it'd be better to go low key. I'm not going to go in. If You look at the circumstances. Remember, our, our message is unchangeable. Our methods are not. Right? Our message stays the same, but the methods change. I'm not going to, I am not going to reach the youth generation in a three-piece suit. I ain't going to do it, right? I'm going to have to, either I'm going to have to dress like them or I'm going to have to train people who can go dress like them and who can fit in with them, right? Now, I'm not saying that you have to be exactly everything and do everything, but I'm saying you have to be, you have to be acceptable to the group before they will listen to you, Right? Now, you can preach the gospel. I'm not talking about changing the message. And I'm not talking about, you know, <clears throat> all of us in here running out and getting piercings and tattoos. Okay? I'm not talking about that. Amen. Okay? <laughs> but what I'm saying is that <clears throat> you're not going to go... The, the, the tactics that won your generation are not going to win this generation. Right? The strategies will. The principles will. The tactics won't. Matter of fact, if we really wanted to get serious about it, we could win this generation pretty easily. All we'd have to do is find a way to get the message onto every, onto the internet, iPods, and all this kind of stuff, and get it into the technical aspect. And you would reach this generation. But if you're going to stick with, you know, singing three courses of Amazing Grace, you know, in, in the old slow way, and I love the song, I'm not against it, but I'm saying you're not going to reach them the same way. You're going to have to have methods. You know, it's amazing too because um, we look at these methods and we think they're so holy. And you would think that you could find all the things that we do in the Bible and you can't. You know, the idea of an altar call wasn't even done before Finney did it. Right? He instituted, actually at that time it was even called the anxious seat. It wasn't even an altar call. They had a chair up front. And at some point during his preaching, if you got concerned that you might not be saved, then you would come up and sit in a chair. And that let everybody know that you were concerned about your soul. And then later on, he didn't even pray for them. Then he would take them. Finally, it got to where so many people were concerned about their soul 
that he said, okay, we're going to adjourn and go over to the next building so I can talk to you about this because you didn't talk about it in the church building. You had to go to the annex where it's okay to talk and, and to converse because in the church, only the pastor spoke. You see, so the whole idea was different. And yet we look at what we do is, and the way we do it is so holy. Our methods are not holy, right? It's the message that's holy. And we have to adapt the method without changing the message. So, and the problem is we've tried to adapt the message. That's what's happened in the church. <clears throat> we've, not, we've tried to keep the methods and not you know, change them, but yet we want to change the message to try to reach people, and you end up watering it down to the point where there's nothing worth them coming to the church for. And yet we want to you know, keep our methods right because our structure, it's got to stay. Why? Because that's where your security is. It usually is in your structure. So you have to look at your situation when you go into it and be flexible enough, like Paul said, to become all things to all men. You have to be able to, you know, I, there's, there's <clears throat> you have to be able to adapt. Simple as that. And so you can't, you know, even in J.G. Lim, we have different types of people all over the country. Now, mostly it's, it's the, the principles of the people we draw are all the same. But yet we've got people that wear three-piece suits. And then we've got people that most of the time wear blue jeans. And so, you know, we're, we're kind of known more now for, you know, blue jeans and vests, actually. <clears throat> but the idea is that we don't want to be set on just that. We want to be able to be flexible enough, but yet our message goes into some churches where they're much more formal. And yet, over a period of time, you know, the, the sum total of our message is just simple, use what works. You know, let's get away from all the stuff that doesn't work, and let's cut to the chase and use what really works. And so the people we draw are generally not <clears throat> people that are drawn to trappings. You know, most of the people in JGLM couldn't care less what the building looks like. You know, they came for a message, not for the looks. And so they're very practical, very oriented. And, you know, that's why I, I thank God, you know, for the women in my church. Because if it wasn't for them, that church wouldn't look like anything. I mean, there would be no, it, it doesn't look like much now, but I guarantee you, if they weren't there, it wouldn't look like anything. You know, because they, they've dressed it up a little bit and put a coffee table here and that kind of stuff. And, you know, they asked me when we were doing the nursery. And they said, we got to get some stuff in here for the kids and put this stuff up. And I'm like, okay, you know, because this looks bad and it's too bare and we need to get some of these things. And I, I told myself, then you get it because, you know, as far as I'm concerned, get some chairs, sit them in there and go after it, you know, <laughs> and which is not the way you reach children, all right? <laughs> so <clears throat> now I got my daughter in there and I didn't tell her what to do, but she's, she has had to figure this thing out on her own, right? And she's in there doing puppets and the whole bit and I never thought I'd see her doing that. But it's amazing because she has just jumped in there and, and ran with it. And our, our nursery area and the, the children's ministry is going, you know. It, it's probably going smoother than any other area of the ministry, to be honest with you. <laughs> so, I, I'm just kind of like, here it is, here's the message. And when we go in, our, our whole church service is, uh, <clears throat> I don't want to say we have a pattern, because well, I guess we kind of do, but it's, it's not set. You know, sometimes we'll do worship at the beginning. Most of the time we do it at the end. And the reason being is because I have found out that in most churches, if you do worship at the beginning, people use that as the, you know, if you, when you go to the movies, they have the previews. People use the worship for the previews. They know, well, they're going to sing for 20, 30 minutes, so we're not late. And so they'll come in about, we start at 5 o'clock, and they'll come in about 5.20. And so after about the first two weeks, I thought, no, this ain't going to work. And we want people here for the worship. So I started telling people, 5 o'clock, I'll start preaching. And they usually are there when I start preaching. So we get them there on time that way. And then we'll have, I'll have the preaching, and then we'll, a lot of times we'll have um, any announcements or whatever we need to do, and testimonies and outreach testimonies and things like that. And then we'll go into the ministry of the word or whatever we're going to be doing. And then at the end, then we'll do worship. And we don't have a worship team. We've got a guy that plays the guitar. And that's it. And he writes the songs. He has taken the J.G. Lim message and put it in song. And it's, it's accurate, you know. And so it's not a big production. And sometimes he'll lead the worship. Other times we'll put on CDs and just play CDs. You know, because why reinvent the wheel? If you've got good CDs that have a message that doesn't violate what we're preaching, then, and if it says something that I want to get across to people, we'll put three or four, I'll say play this one, this one, and that one. Why? 
I'm not trying to get you into some state, you know, I'm going to take you into fast and exciting and then slow you down into worship so that you'll calm down and be ready to hear. We don't do that. These, the songs we, we play have a message that I want the people to hear. And so we're building that into them. And, we're, you know, we're not doing anything right, but it's working, right? We're not doing the way they would teach you to do it at, at Bible, Bible school, you know, how you have to lead worship and all that. But it's what we're doing, and it's working. So, you know, <clears throat> you just have to, you have to be flexible enough to find what works. But the key, the objective should always be reaching the people, bringing glory to God, and bringing the people to a place where they will expand the kingdom. So that's it. So, <clears throat> most churches do not take into account the current situation. They are determined to continue to do things the way they've been done for the last 50 years, if, if not more. While we cannot change our message, we must adapt our methods. We must find ways to make the gospel relevant to this generation. Now, what that means, I'm not talking about adapting the message, right? The gospel is relevant to this generation, but you have to find what is relevant to the generation to apply the gospel to, right? Because a lot of the situations that, you know, the, the, the generation that most of us grew up in is not the generation that's out there. That's why one of the things that I want to do in the Bible school, at least in a portion of it, is I wanted to teach. When you go into the military, they have a class on what's called um, doctrines and customs or traditions and customs. And they teach you the history of the military branch that you're in. And they tell you all the customs. They, they talk to you about saluting and rank. And they talk to all these different areas of customs and courtesies that you're to show to higher ranking officers. And what I want to do in the Bible school is, because one of the things I notice in the generation, not just really, it really started with our, my generation, but the generation that's out today has very little respect. And they don't know how to show respect or politeness or courtesy. And so I think that a minister of the gospel, being polite doesn't make you a minister. But I believe being a minister should make you polite. Simple as that. Now, that, now you know when I'm preaching... I'm straightforward, so I'm not talking about sugarcoating anything. I'm not talking about that kind of politeness. I'm talking about yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, opening doors for people, holding doors, standing up when ladies walk in, things like that. You say, what does that got to do with the gospel? Nothing has to do with character. And you can build, and if you pay attention to that, and you pay attention to those kind of character issues, then those character issues will automatically bleed over into the other issues, and that, that, which is why the military does it. You know, it's why they put you in a uniform, so you'll all be uniform, right? And so they try to, bring, to build that, that conformity, but well, that's what we want. Now, so, <clears throat> yeah, we must find ways to make the gospel relevant to this generation. To do this, we, we must give a pure gospel message to the next generation and then allow them to present that pure message in their own methods. See, that's the hard part for the church. The church is ready to give them a, a message and all, but we want to make sure that they do it exactly the same way we do it. Rather than allowing them to have a pure message, make sure the message is right and let them adapt it because they know what will reach their generation. Right? To do this, where are we at? Yep, yep. What worked to reach the last generation won't reach the next generation. Tactics change, strategies do not. Methods change. Message does not. Human nature is still the same. In past generations, people sat by their radios and listened to long plays, talking about, well, to long plays on the radio, or programs. This generation has an attention span in minutes equal to their age in years. Now, honestly, that, that's a proven fact. Every person basically has an attention span that equals their age. All right? That's why children need breaks more often, things like that. But with the advent of television and commercials, we generally have about a 30-second span, right? And if you can, you're doing good. That's why a lot of churches, you see them, they're going to 30-minute services because people are used to 30-minute programs. They are used to being able to only sit for about 30 minutes, and even then you need commercials about every six and a half to seven minutes. And so that's why the, in a lot of churches, you, you go around the country, it's amazing what you're seeing in the churches of how they're setting things up is becoming like watching television. Matter of fact, in Dallas, there's a church there that we went into one Sunday morning. We don't have we don't have a Sunday morning service at this point. 
<clears throat> but we were down in Dallas. I, I saw this huge church packed out. I said, well, let's go over there and just see what they're doing, hey, you know, who they are. Because you couldn't tell by, their, uh, by the name what group they were. So we walk in. It's like walking into a mall. This thing is so big, different classrooms. All it was huge. And you walk on down, and you see people kind of standing around talking. And, and so I thought, well, there's a lot of people here, but there's a lot of people standing around just talking. So we walked on through the halls, and there was a little uh, waiting room, a little closed-in area, had a television up, had somebody preaching on television, and people sitting around just kind of talking and fellowshipping, drinking coffee, had a little coffee shop in one area, had a little bookstore over in another area. And so I walk in, and I thought, well, you know, what time is church service? What does it start? When does it start? Oh, it started about 20 minutes ago. Really? And everybody's just kind of sitting around talking. You know, to, what's everybody doing? So I asked the directions. They told me how to get in the sanctuary. And I walked around and opened the door. And they had 2,000 people sitting in there. And they had a screen up. And there wasn't even a preacher. It was, he had preached the night, this was Sunday morning. He preached Saturday night at his church, which is about 30 miles away. They did a DVD, sent it over to that church. People were watching a DVD. 2,000 people sitting watching a DVD. And then, whenever, and then he would break and he'd say, all right. Now, if you want to receive Christ, he gave the altar call. And they had workers that got up off the front aisle and came up and stood to deal with the people. And then when he got done, he said, all right, now we're going to finish up with some worship so y'all can stay in worship a while if you would like. And then he stopped, and then a worship team got up on the platform and did worship, live worship. But everything, the message and everything else was all by video. And now that I've found out that they've got another church plant about 20 miles from there that they just started doing the same thing. So this guy preaches one time on Saturday night, and that message is played on, on DVD throughout the week. And it's, it's spreading. So, but people are used to that. We're a television generation, so you can get away with that. And, well, well, working and effectiveness may be different, okay? <clears throat> because I found out what group they were with, and they're a group that's known for not really believing a whole lot, right? So for them, it probably is working because they don't have to do much. You know, there's not a whole lot to do. So, but what I noticed is that, <clears throat> well, it's the same thing. You're seeing it in, in, you know, Bible colleges. A lot of the Bible colleges now are using DVD and, and things like that to watch. In a, you know, instead of having live instructors, you've got, uh, you watch DVDs, which is fine. I don't have any problem with that because you watch a DVD of the DHT, and it's like being there for the most part. You know, the only problem is sometimes you can't ask some of the questions you may have, but a lot of times I answer the questions anyway because, most times people's questions are no different. All the questions are pretty much the same. And, and whoever's showing the DVD usually has actually been through the DHT, so you can actually ask them questions. So I don't have any problem with that. What we're trying to work out now is we want to get set up so that we can, whatever, wherever we're at, we can turn around and put it on the Internet live while we're doing it anywhere. And that way you would just, all you'd have to do is go to our website, go to a little corner link that says webcast, click on that, and it would come up with a, like a television screen that you could actually watch us wherever we are, and it'd all be live. And so we're, you know, we're trying to move into that. We've got a, a situation now where we want to do the Bible school in Dallas that would be a set time people could get on there, and we would have, actually have a person sitting on the side with their computer, and we would have a chat room, like an instant messenger thing, going on where anybody watching from anywhere, if they, if they were watching it at home, they're watching it live, but since we couldn't talk to them, they can basically send the message of a question, and that person watching the computer will say, uh, Curry, we have a question from so-and-so in you know, Fort Collins. And here's the question. He would read the question, and I could answer it right there so the person sitting at home could actually get their questions answered live. And so, you know, if, if we got the technology, let's use it. You know, the devil's sure not going to sit around and waste technology. So we ought to use it, right? And we, can, we have the potential. You get on the Internet like that, you got a potential of, what do they say, what over, uh, was it, 2 billion people now have Internet? Something like, something like that. I mean, obviously, everybody in the world can, can get it, but they say two, roughly 2 billion people, I think, right now have access to Internet. So you have a potential audience of however many people can get on there. So I say, you know, let's go for it. Want the mess if you really want to get the message out and you take all the money out of it, then it gets real easy to spread a message. It only gets complicated when you try to figure out ways to control it so you can keep making money. So that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get to a place where all of our material will be free. Uh, that's what I want to do. I want to make it all free because it, it'll simplify a lot, whole lot. And it'll help spread the message. That's why you know I don't care if y'all copy the CDs and stuff and give them away. I don't care, you know, for the most part. Now, 
obviously we do make a living and a lot of times it's the media sales that actually allow us to go in places where a lot of times we can't take up an offering. We, you know, like when I went up to the, the uh, Indian Reserve up in Canada, you can't take up an offering up there. They don't have any money. And so we have to, we go in there. I gave them CDs, DVDs. I gave them, uh, what, T-shirts. I mean, I gave away everything I had. And so we do make money off of it. But at the same time, if we're trying to spread a message, we're trying to get it out there. We want to start putting our messages on MP3 where you can go on and download them. You know, so there's a lot of things in the works, and I'm telling you, my heart is getting this message out. I'm not trying to build, you know, finances. That's not the point. You know, everybody has to make a living. Everybody has to live. We have to eat. We have to have gas, and gas prices the way they've been. You know, it, it, we could definitely feel it. But at the same time, the message is what counts. And so I've never griped about somebody making a copy for somebody, especially somebody who couldn't afford it. There's times, most of the time, my guys basically know my heart on this, that if somebody can't afford something, we don't turn people away for it. We don't want somebody not to get it because they don't have money. So we've always done that. So, All right. Where are we at here? Yes. The enemy's use. I'm going to have to send you to break. The enemy's use of the principle of maneuver. The enemy's use of the principle of maneuver in individual combat is this. The enemy's use of this principle is simply this. If one tactic does not work, he will change until he finds one that will work. If he does not find a tactic that will work, he will leave and return at a more opportune time. Matthew 4, 1 through 12 says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If you be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil takes him up into the holy city and sets him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If you be the Son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil takes him into an exceeding high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto him, all, thing, all these things will I give thee, if you will fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only, him only thou shalt serve. Then the devil leaves him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. And in the original Greek, where it says they, that the devil left him, it said, For a more opportune time. And so he will try to find a tactic that works, but if he can't find one, if one doesn't work, he'll change to another. And if that doesn't work over a period of time, then he will leave you alone. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to leave you alone forever because he will come back at some point to check you out. But at least he'll leave you alone. So basically, you could starve him out. You could just not let his tactics work to a point where he will leave you alone. So you can get to a place where the devil really doesn't bother you that much. Especially, you can work on one area at a time until you beat him in every area to where he really has no area to come in on you. So, the enemy will probe for a weakness, and if he finds it, he will exploit it. If he does not, he will leave and wait for a better opportunity. Now, that's individual warfare. In corporate warfare, it works like this. The enemy will scan each person in a congregation looking for a weakness that can be exploited. The more sins the enemy can get the leader involved in, the less the leader, the less sins, the leader can preach against. Usually the, the sin you defend is the sin you're in. Right? And the sin you won't preach against is usually the sin you're practicing. So that's just a good rule of thumb. The more sins that the enemy can get the leader involved in, the less sins, obviously, that the leader can preach against. The more sins the congregation is involved in, the less they give. Now, notice, the, you get this. See, this is a major point. This, this will tell you why some preachers preach some things and won't preach others. <clears throat> the more sins the congregation is involved in, the less finances they will give when the preacher hits their sin. Because it makes them mad. Now, subconsciously, it may not be a conscious decision, but subconsciously, that's what happens. <clears throat> now, the enemy will move or maneuver from person to person and from time to time throughout the congregation to exploit each weakness when it best suits his purposes. 
This is adding the principle of economy of force with the principle of maneuver. This is how the enemy uses that against it. He'll go through each one and hit. Now the Christian's use of the principle of maneuver individually is this. The best use of this principle by a Christian is in keeping the flexibility to change tactics as needed. Now here's the areas of potential dangers. Legalism. Legalism is, a, is the most opposite principle against the principle of maneuver. See, when you're legalistic, you are absolutely inflexible. You will not change at all to any degree. Now, I'm not talking about compromise. That's a whole different thing. But I'm talking about if you are legalistic, then your sense of security and being is in you keeping things the way they are, not in your relationship with Christ. Now, <clears throat> legalism is void of flexibility. I think it says if there, but yeah, it's void of, should, should be an O. Almost always devoted more to a method than to the freedom of the oppressed. And it gives false security. Legalism, the Pharisees were legalistic. And they were always more interested in doing things right, according to them, than setting people free. And even when people got free, they got mad because it wasn't done the way they thought it should be done. That's a prime example of legalism. So we should rejoice over the freedom more than the method, even though at the same time we should always be moving toward purity of method according to the Bible. Right? Now, next one, pride. Many times if someone makes a stand or a certain statement, they would rather try to fulfill the statement or stand even if it is wiser to change. This is not referring to compromise. This is when a Christian continues on a certain path so that they don't look bad in front of others. They don't want to change because they don't want to look like they've backed up or, or had to retreat in some area. Some build massive cathedrals as monuments to self and then must constantly badger the Christians for finances to keep it running. Now see, rather than, see they'd rather do that than to say, you know what, we're in over our heads. We need to get out of this thing and let's go cheaper. It'd be better to do that and not badger the people for money and let the people stay spiritual and stay focused on spiritual things. This is where counting the cost beforehand would come into play. Now the Christian's use of this <clears throat> the principle of maneuver in corporate warfare is this. In a corporate setting, Christians should not have a sentimental attachment to a building. Because if you do, then it becomes the purpose of keeping that building going. Jesus didn't die for buildings, he died for people. They should be able to use what is available without becoming attached to what they use. We must learn to remain mission-oriented, not empire-minded. If another group is effective at winning the lost, we should back them and learn from them. This does not mean that we should endorse all their teachings or activities, but we must remain flexible, and by doing so, you will be able to react to situations faster. Okay? So you don't just because just they're not part of our group, doesn't mean we shouldn't have anything to do with them. If they're good at witnessing, then let them witness. Go out. When you, when you know they're out witnessing, let them go. And as they witness to people, if they need prayer for healing, then minister healing. Or if they need a place to grow, then... Talk to them and, and disciple them. Right? But learn from different groups on how they do things. You can learn from the cults. Not doctrinally. But I'm saying in their methods. They have... The Bible even says that sometimes the children of the world is wiser than the children of the kingdom. You know, the Jehovah Witnesses are highly effective at training their people. You know, you may not... <clears throat> it is amazing because how they train them they make them almost impossible to reach sometimes. You know, they may not be able to convert you, but you may not be able to make headway into them either. Just because they are so, they have such a defense built up that everything you're saying, even while you're saying the right things that they could believe, and they say, that's true, that's true, they're also saying that Satan is working through you, and even if you say the right things, they can't, go with you and agree with you to the point of conversion because Satan is behind you. So they, they, have them, they have a wall built up of security around them. We need to do the same thing with Christians. 
We need to get Christians back to where they know the doctrines of the Bible, the basics, especially the essentials, so that you're not afraid, and I'm not talking about an argument, but you're not afraid to debate with somebody. You're not afraid to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with somebody and say, you know, no, the Bible doesn't teach that. But see, the problem is we can't even do that in the church. You can't even argue against, against a, a doctrine in the very church you go to. First off, you're wrong if you argue. You're wrong if you debate. You're wrong if you discuss these things. Well, first off, if you can't discuss it or debate it, you can't fight it. And I'm not talking about blasting a person. I'm talking about a doctrine. And you ought to be able to talk about a doctrine and discuss a doctrine scripturally. But now we've got even the church, well, well, that's your interpretation. No, there's only one interpretation. That's God's interpretation. And God being the word, well, I think he can say what he means and means what he says. And you don't have to read things into it. I tell you, honestly, the church has got a lot of problems. A lot of them. And there's a lot of things that it's going to take, unless it's a, a, a miraculous event, it's going to take time to come back in and undo those things that have been built up over the years. But it's sure not going to work if we go along with them. And so you have to start, you know, I, I don't want to say rebelling against them necessarily, but it is right to rebel against the wrong thing. Right? And most people don't, don't see that. So you have to decide. <clears throat> David rebelled against Saul. That's what he did. He did it right. But he was also in rebellion. Isn't that right? He was in rebellion against the king. Even though he was handling it right. So you can handle it right and be in rebellion. And it be right as long as you're rebelling against the works of the enemy. Right? Our problem is, well, we think we ought to have just absolute peace. Jesus said, I, you think I come to bring peace? I didn't come to bring peace. I come to bring a sword. He said, I came to bring division. But yet, you talk about division in church today, and it's always evil. And really what it means is, don't argue with whoever's in leadership, because he doesn't want any problems. And you might make too good an argument. So, but you have to know what the Bible says, and you have to be able to defend what you believe. Right? That's why kids, Christian kids go to college and come back heathen. Because they weren't trained in what they believe and they couldn't stand against the philosophies of man because we won't allow debate and won't allow training and drilling. I had a guy the other, or a person the other day in our church, as a matter of fact. He's got two girls that are young and he's got, actually just had two twin sons. And they were on the, at the hospital going up the um, elevator. And some people stepped on and the little girl blessed them. The people got on. And they asked him, said, well, you know, wh where'd you learn that? And, they, and she said, my daddy taught me. And the, they said, you, you know, you're teaching me. Yeah, we train them. You know, witness to everybody. Talk to everybody. You're brainwashing those children. And he said, yes, I am. Yes, surely am. You know, and they meant it bad, but he, come on, brainwashing is not a bad word. But we, matter of fact, we need our brains washed. Isn't that right? It's called renewing of the mind. But you've got to get to a place where you can Stand on what you know. That's the problem in the church. Nobody wants to stand for anything. We want to flow with the Spirit, meaning blow with the wind. And the Spirit is solid. If you're going to flow with the Spirit, you're going to be solid in what you know. You're not going to sway the Spirit when it comes to doctrine. All right? All right, let's take a break. Nope, right? Nope.